Welcome back to High School Physics Explained and today I'm wanting to give you an introduction to rotational mechanics. That is looking at motion in a rotational frame. Now you may be familiar with my video on circular motion and I use this little example here to discuss the nature of circular motion and that an object traveling around in a circle is experiencing something called centripetal acceleration inward. But you also remember that I talked about the velocity and the velocity is always at a tangent to the motion. However, the velocity here, which is the rate of change of displacement, has a couple of issues. The first issue is when I travel completely 360 degrees, I could argue that my displacement here is zero because I'm back to the original. So my net displacement always ends up being zero every revolution. So if I move around once, twice, three, four times, every time my displacement is a zero. How do I discuss the, the fact that I've actually done multiple turns? The second thing is if I change my radius so that my radius increases, then my velocity increases as well. Because my velocity is equal to 2 pi r over t, and because I'm increasing r, my velocity increases, even though the rate of turning is exactly the same. So Instead of using linear displacement and linear velocity, we start using, looking at the angles to look at the motion of a circle. Before we start though, we need to have a brief look at how we measure angles. Now you may be familiar, the fact that when we measure angles, we use the idea of degrees. And so a complete 360 turn means simply that we've come across 360 degrees. Now the whole idea of degree is an ancient one but the number is relatively arbitrary. Now we're not sure exactly why it ended up being 360. Is it because of the fact that we travel around the sun 365 days and that number is closer? Or it's based on a numerical system that is based on the number 60, which was invented by the Babylonians? It doesn't really matter. The fact is, is that it's an arbitrary indication and we could have well have chosen anything else in the ancient past to make a measurement of our angles. What we need is something that is unique to the circle. And so the key for us understanding how we look at angles relates to a very important number, and that is the number pi. And we know that pi approximates to 3.14, or approximates to the fraction of 22 over seven. But what is the significance here? For thousands of years, societies have recognized that there is a special relationship between the circumference of a circle and its diameter, which is d. And so if you get the circumference and divide it by the di diameter, you always get this value of pi. And it's an irrational number. From this, that we have that the circumference of a circle is equal to pi d. And that is the simple mathematical formula for determining the circumference of the circle. But it's because of this particular ratio that the circumference divided by the diameter always ends up being this particular constant. As a result, because the diameter is twice the radius, we get the formula of 2 pi r as our circumference. Now we're gonna use that to understand how we measure angles related to this. So now we're in a position to establish an SI unit for an angle in terms of what we call a radian. So a radian is going to be our SI unit. So what is a radian? A radian is an angle such that if I were to turn my angle in such a way that the path I trace from here to here is equal to the distance of my radius. So this angle here is equal to one radian. What about a complete revolution? So a complete revolution is how many radians? So what we say is, well, theta, which is our angle radians, is going to be equivalent to a complete path of, well, a complete path, of course, is the circumference, which is going to be two pi r. But using our definition of the radian, we know that one radian is going to be 
equivalent to the path of R. So looking at the ratios, you see that the angle is going to be equal to or equivalent to 2 pi R over R, which is going to be equal to 2 pi. In other words, a complete loop is 2 pi radians. That means half the loop is only going to give us pi radians. A quarter of it, which we know is equivalent to 90 degrees, is only pi over 2 radians. Similarly, 270 degrees is going to be equivalent to 3 pi over 2 radians. So now we have the correct way of us describing angles in an SI unit called the radian. So now let's examine how we talk about displacement and velocity and acceleration. So let's have a look at linear first. We know that in displacement we use the symbol S. Rotationally though we're interested in angles so we're going to use the symbol theta. Theta will always be in radians. What about velocity? Well velocity is rate of change of displacement. So that's going to be S over T and we ascribe the symbol there for V. But rotationally we are going to be talking about the rate of change of angle. So that's going to be theta over T. And the symbol we use there is going to be omega, which looks like a W, but it's a bit more curved. It's the Greek lowercase last letter of their alphabet. And the unit there will be radians per second. What about acceleration? Well, acceleration is simply equal to the rate of change of velocity. But in terms of rotational acceleration here, and I'm not talking about centripetal acceleration, I'm talking about something speeding up as it turns in a circle, is going to be the symbol alpha. And that alpha, similarly to this formula, is going to be the change of angular velocity. So omega final minus omega initial over t, or you could say delta omega over t. So these are the variables or dimensions that we use more commonly in rotational analysis. But is there a relationship between these two? Well, there is. Since omega is the rate of change of angular displacement, that is theta over t, we know that if something goes in a complete circle, then the total angle that it makes is now 2 pi. The total time is the period, so you get 2 pi over t is your angular velocity. Now 1 over t is the frequency, so you can now replace this with 2 pi f, that the velocity is equal to 2 pi r over t, that is the circumference divided by t. Can you see that over here I have 2 pi over t, which I know to be omega. So the velocity is equal to omega r. So there's the connection between the linear velocity at any one point, which is equal to the angular velocity multiplied simply by the radius. And that makes sense. If you increase the radius, the velocity increases as well. Since omega is 2 pi f, we know the linear velocity will simply be equal to 2 pi r f. Now let's just quickly have a look at centripetal acceleration which is the acceleration going in towards the center. If you remember, the centripetal acceleration is equal to v squared over r. But we know that v is equal to omega r. So you have omega r all squared over r, and as a result, you get omega squared r. So there is our introduction to the concept of angular motion, the term of displacement, velocity and acceleration. In subsequent lessons, I'm going to be looking specifically at a number of other variables which change if they're placed in rotational situations, where force becomes torque, where mass becomes moment of inertia. And we also look at the issue of angular momentum as opposed to linear momentum. Just one last piece of the puzzle is in the matter of direction. Angular velocity is a vector, so it has not only a magnitude, but also a direction. So how do we establish the direction of angular velocity or angular displacement? So let's say this disc here is spinning in this direction like so. Now, if you're watching it from the top, 
it's going to go anti-clockwise. And if you're watching it from the bottom, it will be going clockwise. But we don't establish direction in terms of clockwise or anti-clockwise. We actually establish it from the axis. And the way that we establish the direction is by using the right hand rule or the right hand group rule. So imagine here's your hand, your right hand, and you curl your fingers so that they point in the direction of the rotation. Your thumb therefore represents the direction for that situation. So in the case that we have in front here, the direction of the angular velocity is actually upwards. Now this seems a little bit weird or a little bit counterintuitive, but it's important to understand this if you're going to get a better understanding of some of the consequences of changing angular velocity. So things such as looking at torque, looking at precession, angular momentum and all those factors, they rely on the fact that the vector for the rotation of angular velocity, angular of displacement is going to be in a direction that follows this particular rule. And that brings us to the end of our understanding of angular displacement and velocity. Thanks for watching. Please remember, like, share and subscribe. And by the way, drop a comment down below if the video particularly has been useful. And finally, consider supporting me via Patreon. The idea is to develop resources and equipment to continue to teach physics at a high school level. I'm Paul from High School Physics Explained. Bye for now.